this offer may not be repeated again It's a plan that was made so many years ago At a hill called Mount Calvary on an old rugged cross It's so simple, a child could understand Yet it's freely offered to every woman and man A chance of a lifetime, a guarantee If you call on him now, he'll give you life eternally Offer still
Father. Bless your name, Father. I'm thankful that God goes with us. He always goes with us. He promises he would. And he holds our hand. Amen. If you need the words in your hand, it's page 52 in the hymnal, but the words will be on the screen. Jesus, hold my hand.
Father. Hallelujah. Every time I've knelt in prayer and hoped to meet him there, I've never walked away disappointed. Have you? If you have never walked away disappointed, that's enough to give him praise for right there. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Father. You are worthy. Hallelujah. Do you know we serve a great God? sing that again in just a moment but you know we have two miracles setting in our midst today Amen. Amen. one of the last times I saw her in the hospital but one of the last times I saw Junie was on a helicopter she didn't know me she couldn't talk she couldn't do anything she was just this close to death and she walked in the house of God today and able to talk to us. Amen. Clothed and in the right mind. Michelle, 
we've been praying for her they said she had a mass in her jaw said had it gone said it gone down into the bone they said in her jaw last sunday morning god moved in this place she went this week and they told us that we don't understand it but all it was just a shadow from the x-ray all it was was just a shadow i'm telling you that wasn't just a shadow god removed cancer i believe from her jaw we need to praise god around here today for stuff like that did you hear what i said we need to, amen sing it yes yes Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank You're you, Jesus. worthy of it all. You are worthy, worthy of it all. all. Worthy of it all. You are worthy 
you want this morning? Holy Spirit, rain down. Rain down. Oh, comforter and friend. How we need your touch. you praise him as loud as you can praise him this morning holy spirit rain down rain down in this place lord touch people's lives today amen you may be seated this morning we do have a whole lot to praise him for don't we that's miracles folks i said that's miracles a miracle is when you have to step back and say that had to be God. That's what a miracle is, and we thank God for the miracles that God's done for our church. I never ask you to do anything that I didn't feel in my heart and my spirit. I've never been one of the pastors that tried. I don't know. I don't want to be whatever, what I'm fixing to say. I hope everybody would take this right. I know our church doesn't have the thousands of dollars. I see pastors pledge at camp meetings. They'll stand up and pledge thousands of dollars before even coming to the church. But I trust you. I believe that you love the Lord, and I believe you love people. And I'm just believing this morning that we're going to be able to give a good offering to the world missions in, in uh, endeavor of our state. Uh, some might say, well, you know, why, why we do this when we got our own needs? Like I said earlier, I believe if it wasn't for some of the things our church has done over the last few years, I don't even know. I know we would not have made it financially. I know we wouldn't have. I've seen the books. I've seen, I've seen it. And I really believe it's because even as a church our size, we've done everything we can to reach people in our community and feed and do those things. And the last time I read the word, if you do those things, if you give, God will give back to you. And I believe that's what's happened with our church. And I ask you to just do your very best this morning in this world missions offering. And I'll be taking it to camp meeting this week as a representative of our church. And I believe God's going to bless us. Would our ushers come back this morning if they would and 
receive this offering today and uh, and I ask you just to do the very very best that you can in this in this offering today amen amen I'm glad to have all these Florida people back today amen we had people a lot of people in Florida this week but uh, father in heaven I ask you today Lord I can't do I can't ask people to do something that I won't do and Father, this morning I'm putting my offering in today to bless those people, or those children that are being trafficked Amen. and Amen. and those sex, sexually abused and those in that area. God, it's so tremendous. God, it's staggering. And I pray, God, that we can help at least one child to get out of that predicament. And God, I'll give you the praise and I'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sing it one time to God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory, the things He has done with His blood. Saved me with his power, he has raised me to God. Be the glory for the things he has done. Would you give him praise one more time this morning? Amen get a chance before you leave today make sure to step over to the fellowship hall and the flooring is down all the way to the bathrooms amen except the bathrooms the flooring is laid and it looks so good Jackie and Roger I thank them so much for for uh, what they've done this week we're able to get the flooring and they got it down and and uh, Barbara and Yogi's son painted and it looks so good over there and Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock Sister Sharon's going to put some of you to work. Amen. She wants you to come, if you could, uh, to help to uh, clean the tables and everything before they go back into the fellowship hall. So if you could do that Tuesday morning, that would be a really, really good thing. Amen. Our seniors raising the money for that. Thank you so much for what you've done. Amen. Our children can be dismissed this morning. I believe y'all be going back here, guys. This way, guys. I believe next week you'll be able to head that direction. Amen. Amen. A lot of our kids missing today. Amen. So good to, don't you love them? Amen. All right. I'm so proud of my son today. He's preaching the Father's Day message in Kingsport this morning. So that makes me, makes me uh, uh, just an honored dad to know that he's up there doing that. And Catherine's mom turned 88 here recently, and they had a big celebration for her up on Roan Mountain in Tennessee. If you've never been up there, it's where the rhododendron flowers are. Don't go the third week of June, because we were up there yesterday, and it was crowded. So uh, 
but it was but it was a good day. And let me say again, Happy Father's Day to all of our dads, and we love you. And uh, and like I said, if your father's living, you need to really try to contact him or be with him if you can, because there will come a day that you wished you could, and uh, come a day that you wished you could. And so. Uh, God is good to us. I want you to turn with me this morning uh, to about three different scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and then we're going to be reading verse 33. Then we're going to go to a story that I don't know that I preached on in uh, almost 40 years of preaching now. I don't know if I've ever preached on this particular passage of scripture that the Lord brought to my heart this week. But it's in 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. Then we'll read verse 18. Would you stand with me for the reading of the word? If I were to title this message today, I would, I would title it, Influence is a Mighty Force. Amen. Influence is a Mighty Force. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Then in 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 9, For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So we went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Then verse 18 says, and he, dis and he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink, and drink water. But he lied yeah, he to him. Yeah, he did. But he lied to him. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, I need your help today. Lord, all week long you've spoke to my heart, and if I... Let, let, you, let you speak to me. Father, I knew today that this is a message that we must need to hear because everybody in this place has influence. Everybody influences somebody in some way. And Father, I pray today that before we leave here today that we'll understand how powerful that our influence is. And God, I will give you praise and I will give you glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Turn to the person beside you and say, you've got what he's preaching about today and his influence. You've got it. I want to talk to you today about one word. And I pray this word will come alive and leave an a, a lasting impression upon your heart. And, that's, and it's that word influence. What is influence? Influence is the ability of a person to compel others to think or feel or behave in a specific manner. We got to understand that the people that we hang with the most of the times, it's their thoughts and their ideology that we tend to gravitate to. If we're around somebody a, a lot, and no matter if you if it's good or bad, That's right. That's right. you're going to end up having some of their ideas and their ways and their thoughts. Amen. The way they talk and how they think. Because influence is a powerful thing. Yes, it, is. it really is. They influence how we think whether we realize it or not. But no matter what influenced our choices in life, we're going to be judged not on those choices but on what we lived. What we That's it. Not how they influenced us but how we allowed those influences to affect our own life and our choices. Jeroboam was an evil king. This is a, this is a, this is a crazy story right here. You may, not have, you may have read it before, but never just looked at it like I have this week. But Jeroboam was an evil king who desecrated the altar of God in Bethel by turning it into a place of idol worship. So God sent a young prophet to give a warning message to Jeroboam. The young prophet did as God instructed him and he takes this message to King Jeroboam and the king wasn't happy at all. He didn't like it at all what God had said to him. 
So uh, before he would even believe it, it took God withering his hand and subsequently healing it for Jeroboam to really take the message of God serious. In 1 Kings 13 and 4, the Bible says this, And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar of Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. Yeah. Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it to him again. So if this young man brings this message to the king, the king doesn't believe him, and he reaches out to get the young prophet, and God withers his hand, dries it up, literally dries his hand up. That would get my attention, wouldn't yours? And he dries up the king's hand, and it withers up. But the next verse says... In verse 6, And the king answered and said to the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand be restored again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. So God takes this withered hand that God withered, and the young prophet prays and said, God, make it right again. And when he did, his hand was restored just like it was before. Now that there again would get my attention. And I would want to know that God or, or how that happened. But that's, that's the story. And after his hand was restored, he wanted the young prophet to come to his house and eat so he could reward him. I'd want to thank somebody like that. And listen to what the young prophet says to the king in 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 7. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou will give me half of thy house, or in other words, if you'd give me half of everything that you've got, I still wouldn't go home with you and eat and get this reward. There's no way I would do it. So why, why we wouldn't he do it? I will not go with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in that place. For it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread nor drink water nor return by the same way that you came. So he tells this king, I am not coming to your house. God's commanded me and he's told me what I better do and I don't care if you give me half of what you got I'm not coming to your house to eat bread so the young prophet started home and declining food and drink and leaving by a different way than he came just as God had told him to do but the story takes a tragic turn right here You see, there was an old prophet in the land who heard about the encounter between Jeroboam and the prophet. And he told his sons, I want you to get my donkeys ready. I want you to get them up, get them saddled up. I'm going to find this young prophet. I'm going to find this boy that must have connections with God. I'm going to find him. So he gets on his donkey. And goes to find the young prophet. And when the old prophet found him, he invited the young prophet back to his house for a meal. Yes. For a meal. I want you to come eat with me. I'm going to sit down with you. I want you to see him. I want, I, I want you to come eat with me. I got to find out who you are. I got I to gotta find out about you. And again, the young prophet declined and explained that God told him not to eat or drink anything while he was in Bethel. And the old prophet said this. He said, I too am a prophet, like you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you, with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. He was lying to him. So he went back with him. This young prophet believes him. 
He believes what he said, and he went back with him to the, his house, and he drank water, and he sat down to eat. You see, the old prophet used his influence to get what he wanted. Even though he was leading the next generation into disobedience. The old prophet's use of influence destroyed this young man's life. You know, we're living in a day when so, there are so many so-called prophets. Somebody help me a minute. They call themselves prophets. And they're deceiving a generation. They're lying to a generation. And church people are so gullible that they'll buy their holy water. Somebody help me preach a minute. They'll buy their holy waters and they'll send money to them. And all the time they're doing nothing but lying to you to get your money. I didn't get a whole lot of amens on that, but I got a few. But that's exactly what's happening here. We have so many ungodly prophets. You better try the spirits and see if they're of God. I don't care how much you believe in somebody. You better try the spirits and see if they're from God. Verse 18. The Bible says this, And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came into the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou disobeyed, dis, disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, has not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and has eaten bread and drunk water in this place, of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come into the sepulcher of thy fathers. This young prophet leaves, and when he leaves the king's house or the old prophet's house, a line met him in the way. A line met him in the way and killed him. Verse 24, and when he was gone, a line met him in the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way. The ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. When the news reached the old prophet, what had happened, he began to be remorseful. It bothered him what his influence had done. It really bothered him what, uh, the outcome of his influence. The Bible said when, he, when that news reached the old prophet that he went and found the corpse and brought it home and laid it in his own tomb. Yeah, the old prophet mourned. And I'm just reading you these scriptures today because it overwhelmed me. Verse 27 says, And he spake to his son, saying, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him, and they went and found his carcass, cast in the way, and the ass and the lion were standing by the carcass. And the lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn, nor torn the ass. The prophet took up the carcass of the man of God and laid it upon the ass and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave. And they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And it came to pass after they had buried him that he spoke to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. And lay my bones, lay my bones beside Amen. his bones. He knew that his evil influence had caused the prophet to disobey God. Amen, and he knew he caused the death of that young man of God. Amen. Can I tell you this morning, out of a heart, and the Lord, I'm telling you, I, can I tell you this morning, that everybody in this place, everybody on earth has influence. Paul said, for none of us lives to himself and nobody dies to themselves. You will influence others one way or another. Whether it be good or whether it be evil. 
Influence is more powerful than you think. Influence lives on after you're gone. It it's passed from one generation to another. Your influence will impact your family for generations after you have left this world. See, so when you die in the Lord, your life has a positive influence on your children and their children. How many are glad this morning that if you had a mom or a dad that prayed and, and they took you to the house of God and they served the Lord? A lot of you are here this morning because of that influence that they had upon your life. That godly influence is why some of you are here today. I know this morning that there's several here with Shirley this morning that she influenced them when they were little. And they're here today because of that influence. So when you die in the Lord, you have that positive influence. But if you refuse to follow God, it also influences your children and your children's children. I want to ask you a serious question. And I know the greatest reason we receive salvation is for our own souls. That's why we do it. But why can't, you know, if you love people, if you love your children, and you love your grandchildren, isn't it worth getting saved enough Amen. Come on. that they may follow your footsteps, follow your footsteps not to a place called hell, Amen. but to a place called heaven? Right. Isn't that worth getting saved Amen. for? I really believe it is. Let me ask I, I thought about this question as I was praying this week. I want you to think of the person you love the most, that you cherish the most. Now, I know it don't work this way, but I'm just putting it this way. Would you trust your relationship with God enough that you wouldn't change anything? And that was the determining factor if the, the person closest to you went to heaven or not. Wow. If it was up to how you live for God, for your loved one to go to heaven, is that relationship you have, could you entrust that to know that that person would make it to that place called heaven? Right. That's a big question, isn't it? Because we influence people more than we realize. Your grandchildren are watching you. Yes. Grandmothers and grandfathers. Are you leaving a godly influence that will live on in their lives even after you have gone? I thought about this, that the epitaph in that grave in Bethel could read, Here lies the bones of an old dead shell of a prophet. More tragically, in that same grave, another epitaph could also say, here lies the bones of a young man of God who was led astray by one evil man's influence. Amen. Amen. It would be traffic, tr tragic if your epitaph would say, here lies the bones of a man or a woman who would not serve the Lord. Right. But it would even be more greater of a tragedy if that epitaph of those you influence, read, here lies someone who would, have, who would have followed Jesus, but instead was influenced by a loved one who turned away from God. That's right. One day I'm going to die, Amen. and you're going to die. That's right. And when I die, I want to go with fire in my bones and Jesus in my heart, Amen. and I want to live that godly influence in front of my family. Amen. You see, everywhere you turn in our culture, on television and movies and games, the games they play, and now through sexual education, even in elementary schools, our kids are being told to embrace moral revelism and accept the abnormal and, and unbiblical as simple a matter of a personal choice. 
Moral relativism is the standard of the day. What's right or wrong for you is up to you, not me, and certainly not God. And the prevailing view regarding moral judgment says something is true or false, right or wrong, only relative what it, to what an individual or culture determines. Sometimes called ethical relativism, it is the theory that actions are only right or wrong depending on the moral norms or standards of a society. And the problem with, with that is it's, it's, it's immoral. Throughout history, every society that abandons the concept of moral standard decays into depravity and eventually is destructive. Amen. No honest student of history can deny that fact. And our kids are soaking up those lies more than we realize. Because they're being influenced so much by this world that we live in. Listen to your pastor this morning. The greatest hope that our children have is for godly parents to pour clean living water into their hearts. And I want to ask you a question this morning. How are you influencing your family? How are you influencing your children and your grandchildren? You're either going to influence them this way. You're influencing them some way. Understand that. You're, you're doing it one way. Whether it be to the good, with the living water, or to the bad, it's going to end up like this in their lives. That old prophet... I'd say if he had it to do over again, he wouldn't have done that to that young prophet. Because after it happened, Brother Allen, he had such remorse. It just, but it was too late. He couldn't go back and redo what he'd already done. So I'm going to tell you today, don't wait too late. Don't do something you wished you hadn't have done. Amen. You would say, Pastor, this is, that's a hard statement you're fixing to make. It really is. You don't know how long you'll have your children. Amen, brother. You don't, know. That's it. you don't know how long that you'll be around to influence your children. That's right. So don't wait too late to do that. And the only way that you can influence them in the right way is if you have if you live the right way, That's right. and you influence them the right way, because they're going to follow in your footsteps. Amen. Influence is tough. I'm telling you, you're influencing somebody in your life. Would you stand with me today? Would you stand with me today? Father in heaven, I love you today. I thank you for your love and I thank you for your mercy. Father, we have got this powerful thing that you give us. Influence, that we have an impact on people's lives. Whether good or whether bad. We have an opportunity to influence them and to help them to make it into the kingdom of God. But on the other hand, we have a chance, God, that if we're not careful, we could influence them the other way. And them go the wrong direction. And we'd regret that someday. Father in heaven, if there be anybody here today that knows without a doubt that they've got influence on somebody that they know is not good influence. It might be their child, their son, or their daughter, or their grandchild. Father, I pray today that you would help us all to understand that influence is a powerful thing. This morning, with nobody looking around, is there anybody here today that might say, Pastor, again, I know that I'm not living right. 
I know that my heart is not right and I know what, that I, what I'm pouring into my family's life is not good. I know it's not good for me because I don't want to die lost, but I'm also influencing someone in my family that I know that I shouldn't be doing that. But this morning, I want the Lord to forgive me. I want Him to cleanse me so I can pour the living water into my family, that I can pour the good things into my family, and I can teach them the ways of the Lord and read them the Word of God. And God, I give you praise and I give you glory. In the powerful name of Jesus. In the powerful name of Jesus. In the powerful name of Jesus. Does anybody lift your hand this morning and say, yeah, Pastor. I know without a doubt that I'm, I've got a bad influence on my family. It might be your daughter or your son or your grandchild. And I want to change that because I don't want to see them lost. I don't want to see them die in the way. And this morning, I want to make my life right with God. Is there anybody lift your hand and say, yeah, pastor, that's me. That's, that's me, pastor. I want to make sure that I have the right influence on my family. Is there anybody? Is there anybody? Is there anybody? God help us. God help us that if we would do that knowingly that we're doing it. In the name of Jesus, God forgive us if we are. Is there anybody this morning would slip up your hand and say, yeah, pastor, please pray for me. Please pray for me. I know my influence is not good. They're doing things already that I don't want them to do, but they're watching me. And I don't want them to do that. And I can change that by my positive influence. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Would y'all help me put this table back today, would you? Sing it with her. Let my life be a light shining out through the night. May I help struggling ones to the fold, spreading cheer every sad and the lone my head would you come on up with me this morning family would you come up with me let me be a light shining out through the night may I struggling ones to the fold spreading cheer everywhere to the sad and the low let my life be a light to some soul Amen. I know that was a little different message this morning, but powerful. Powerful. How powerful that word influence is. And all of us, all of us have it. All of us have it in one, some shape, form, or fashion. Every one of us have that influence on somebody's life. So, but I'm telling you, you'll have a thousand times more chance of getting your children to live right. If you live right... Did you hear what I said a thousand more times? We all know that it can go different directions. We've seen it happen. With godly parents, and they still go the wrong way. But you've got more of a chance if you've got that godly influence on their life. God help us. Would you lift your hand this morning and say, God help me to have the right influence. 
Help me to influence my children and my grandchildren, my sons and my daughters in the right way, God. God, please, Lord, help help us, God. Help us to be have that influence, God, that will make a change in their lives. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Help struggling ones to the fold. Help me, God. Help me, God. Help me, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let me say this before we pray anymore. If you're hanging around people that you know are affecting you negatively, you know that they've got into your thoughts and your thinking, quit, don't hang around them. Because influence is so powerful. Amen.